Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor UK series brought to you by the Nyaradzo Group. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. If you enjoy this series, remember to subscribe, to like and to share. Let's get down to some work. Elector Kudzai Bambe, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you, Mr. Ngube, for having me. I'm so privileged to be on this platform. I really appreciate this. We, we love what you do. It's, so it's an honor for us to have this uh, opportunity to sit down with you. you. You're doing something very different and very unique. Try and, and unpack it to us as, as briefly as, as possible. What is it that you do? Okay, I like to call myself a cultural ambassador in that I want to ensure that our heritage is carried forward through our children. And we do that, uh, we started by teaching Shona online so that we could reach all the children uh, across the diaspora who are from Zimbabwe to ensure that it's not lost in translation and also to make sure that they are proud of who mm. they are and where they come from. Mm. I was struck by something that you, you said, uh, which runs across the things that you do, which is Ziwa Kwa how did you arrive at that very powerful statement, that powerful Shona proverb? Um, I would think it started with my son when it was uh, homework time. So I would notice that uh, I was very keen to do the other homework, but not the Shona homework. I would always sort of outsource uh, that. And uh, I think he began to pick up on... You as a mother. Yes. Wow. He started to notice that I would pass it on to somebody else. And I think that started rubbing off. And he started saying, I don't like Shona. It's too hard. Because I am th the person who's supposed to be assisting him is also finding mm, it difficult. Mm, mm. So I reached out to some friends and they seemed to also feel the same way. And their children also didn't like Shona because it was hard. So for me, I thought, hmm, we need to fix this because it can't die with me. It has to, now because my son was now fully English speaking. So I then started being deliberate about it, speaking to him in Shona. And I thought, let me start some Shona lessons. And we started among friends. And then it just grew from there. I'm fascinated. I hear you. Your, your, your child um, is battling with it. You have an attitude uh, to, the, to the language. But ordinarily, most of us would uh, just walk away and do other things, but you didn't. No, because I started to see that I felt like it's got to do with your identity. So the problem with discarding of where you come from, you start to doubt. You have a lot of self-doubt because you don't even know who you are. Who am I? You're living in, in brown, brown. I have really rough hair, but you don't know who you are. That's all you know about yourself, but you don't know where you come from. You don't know your heritage because in that heritage uh, lies so many things. So for example, when I look at my own heritage, I see traits, I see and that's already told me who I am because now along my lineage on my mother's side, it's full of teachers mm. on my father's side. There's musicians. Also on my mother's side, there's a few musicians. But so it's already told me that, ha, huh, perhaps I could dabble in teaching and in music. And so that has actually shaped who I am by just looking back to see where I come from. What kind of feedback are you getting regarding the work that you're doing, particularly the, sh the teaching, Shona? Oh, the parents were like, thank you so much. And I think what was difficult for them is if you're in a home, suppose in Canada, you are the only ones who speak Shona, the three of you, you and your children, well, you, the parents and the mm. children. So now the children are no longer surrounded by anyone else who speaks Shona. So it gets lost because everyone is speaking English, mm. particularly my generation, because we were pushed to speak English. Our parents really wanted us to do well. So they really pushed us to these good schools to speak English throughout and learn really good English so that, you know, you can do well in life. But unfortunately, the unintended consequences were now we are parents who don't know how to speak Shona to our own children. So um, 
Yeah. Have you had different kind of responses? Um, responses, look, I'm in the UK, I'm in Canada, what do I need Shona for? Oh, yes. Um, not from the people who sign up, because clearly they are happy with this project. But I think I was like that myself. It's not like I'm going to use it. I'll give you an example of myself. Personally, at school, we only had to do Shona up to ZJC. Then after that, you can drop it. And we all did, because it was hard. It was, it, and it was not necessary. It was like, what am I going to use it for? But you are going to need it. Because here I am in the UK, and I'm so proud of who I am. And you'll find that a lot of, especially now with this globalization, a lot of people are marrying into other cultures. And you'll find a lot of my adult students are actually spouses of Zimbabweans who have come mm. to the lesson to learn about our culture. Mm. So there must be something great about it if they want to know more. They want to learn the language. They want to learn the culture, especially the adults. We, we teach them about our actual culture. If it's a lady, we're going to teach her, this is what Morora does. This is your duty. Mm -hmm. When you visit your mother-in-law, this is the expectation. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's almost sort of bringing them in, and they absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. Man, it's, it's beautiful. It's so much fun to share what I'm about. But now it's difficult if you don't even know what you're about. Mm -hmm. So I get the sense, <clears throat> Elector, that you are correcting what went wrong with our upbringing which has not been corrected, generally. Um, if, were you to go back, rewind your life to that, that ZJC, what diff something different that you would do regarding the way our languages are taught? <sighs> I think I would make it compulsory, but also make it not so difficult. That's the truth. Mm. The thing is, um, I grew up in a home where my parents both spoke to us in Shona, but they didn't talk to me in Tsumone Matimikira. I mean, once in a while, if I was not there, I just knew I'm in trouble. <laughs> but you see, what, what I feel like for me personally, when you now start bringing in some of the stuff, it's a bit difficult. Mm. But it, I don't want to make it sound too difficult. I just think maybe the way it's taught, mm. the way it's taught and how it's put across, I'll give you, like, for now, my objective is to make it as relevant as mm. possible. Let's go there. How are you doing it? You, 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 you found innovative ways of teaching Shona. Um, talk to us through that. Okay, so one of the things I, I personally prefer to teach children, um, I have other teachers who teach the adults, but for children, I use music. I find that they do better with retaining information if it's sung, because I always say, if you can sing it, you can say it. So we start with just singing and just making it more fun and not blackboard. I call it blackboard teaching, which is very, ah, e, e, o, u. it's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. We put it into a song and mm -hmm. we do actions and we dance to that. And we use a lot of colors, even in our lessons, um, the material that I use, it's very colorful. Uh, and, and I try my best to be as animated as possible and short. Mm. It's not a three hour lesson, <clears throat> 30 minutes, and it's m probably 20 minutes. And then the other 10 minutes, we're either dancing, mm. we're sharing stories, and we are singing. Examples of songs that you sing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll sing you. Um, yeah. um, I, so I've had to write some songs. Yeah. That's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. They were, I didn't feel like there were enough songs to, mm. to, to sing. Um, we, there's one about the weather. It's called Mamiriro Ekunze. Mm -hmm. So that one goes, Mamiriro um, Ekunze, Mamiriro Ekunze. Kana kuchipi satino feka goani. And then we learn about this. So you've already learned mm. about what a hat is. Mm. You've already learned what kupisa is. Mm. You also learn what you wear. Mm. So now they've already chunk learned something in a song wow. without even realizing it. That's beautiful. So when the next lesson, so from that lesson forward, I will ask you, Tarisa Panze. So we do a little rhyme. Tarisa Panze, Tarisa Panze, Kwakamira Se. Then everyone takes a turn. Kuruku Pisa, because they're all, all over the world. Mm. So the one in Canada is going to look out the window, it's snowing, they'll tell me, Kuruku Tonora. The one in Zimbabwe, it's hot, they'll mm. tell me, Kuruku Pisa. So that's how we do it. And you've written a book. Yes. Which is um, also on weather. 
Mamirure um, Ekunze. Yes. Why is weather um, become the, the tool by which you, you teach? Well, this is just one of them. Yeah. But, you know, global warming, I suppose. Yeah. So, but I think it's just <clears throat> one of those uh, things that children need to learn to say amongst many other things. So we will do maybe a song about what your routine is in the morning. So we'll sing a song about mm. um, when I wake up, this is what I do, this mm. is what I eat. Mm. Then, so the next maybe progression is let's learn about the weather since mm. I'm now outside. Mm. We're gonna learn what a pencil is, we're gonna learn when I'm at school, when I play, this is what I do. So it's just, it was just a, one of the tools that I, mm. I thought to use. And, and you're doing this online. Yes. Um, throughout the world. Yes. Where is your biggest market? It changes. Mm. Initially, it was the United States. Mm -hmm. Then it changed to uh, the UK. Mm -hmm. Then at some point, it was South Africa. Actually, right now it is South Africa. Mm. It's South Africa, yes. Um, but I do, and you know, we've actually done every continent except for Asia. That's interesting. <laughs> and, and people can find you online? Yes. Okay, so we'll put the details so that people yes. uh, reach, reach out to you. I think we're going to take a break here. When we come back, um, we're going to go uh, to Electra's passion, and that passion is for um, music and singing, and uh, where that passion came from. You can't fully fulfill your purpose if you don't know who you are. Welcome back to our conversation with Electa Kudzai Bambe, a creative singer, songwriter, cultural ambassador, and a, and a teacher. So teaching Electa seems to have met with a big passion of yours, and you've just say, sang a song for us right now, singing. Talk to us, take to us back to the day or the time you discovered that you had this passion for singing. I can't pinpoint a day, but I do remember a particular thing I used to do with my little sister. We used to sit outside um, the house. Our windowsills were, were low, and I would pretend to play the piano there and make her sing. And so I was her music teacher. So I think I've just always enjoyed that. I think I was about grade one or two when we were doing that. Then with time, I guess I didn't realize it. And it's a thing that I think parents should really look out for. Mm is what do your children enjoy? Just listen and watch. Um, because fortunately, they then noticed a bit later that oh, she seems to like this music thing. And in grade six, I joined the choir. And then I, from there, I was just a chorister throughout. And um, I remember they bought me a keyboard for my, for my uh, 11th birthday. Oh, that was the best day of my entire life. Wow. Because it was recognition that, you know, because generally parents... Old school parents, I, sorry, my parents were old school, I suppose, uh, to me, uh, were very, let's focus on your academics. academics. We want academics, that's paramount. But with them, the minute my father heard that I'm interested in music, oh, he was, what does she want? They got me a keyboard. And then later I decided, ha, ah, I don't want the keyboard, I want the guitar. And my dad's fine, buy her the guitar. So... It was whatever I wanted in terms of music. I was supported 100%, mm. very much supported. So, yeah, I think they, I've always wanted to be a singer, I suppose. I just found myself singing. Mm. But uh, the acoustic night with uh, Tariro Negitari sort of changed the course of your, of your music career. Yes. Take us there. Well, so um, I was in South Africa at the time when I met a gentleman called Andrew Baird. He's a producer. Then I was moving back home after university and I said to him, can you refer me to somebody? I want to start singing. Mm. Then he introduced me to David Singwayo. And so he says, you can come by the studio. So that particular day, I went to the studio and there were a whole lot of people there. And Tarone Gitari was one of them. What's the night Churity was there. Prayer Soul was there. Pure Wood was there. Uh, Kevi was there. And I was like, oh, look at all these musicians. And I couldn't believe 
people were not going to work, but they were in the studio singing. And I absolutely fell in love with, and they were amazing to me. They just took me right in, and then Taro started Acoustic Night. And I remember she says to me, do you want to sing? Why don't you come along mm. and, and you can sing? And from there, it just took off. And it's still going on, Acoustic Night. It's just now happening in mm. Bulawayo, but mm. it's, it's there. And it's a perfect platform for any musician to trampoline off mm. into a music career. What does music do to you? It almost like, if you think of a flower, blossoming and opening up that's what it does to me mm. like i feel like i'm right in the in my element i am i am where i'm supposed to be and um i i think i do struggle with big audiences though i i tend to prefer intimate settings because i like to connect and i feel like if it's too big mm. with the, the 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 connection sort of disappears um but yeah i i feel like i'm right where i'm supposed to be mm. where were you born I was born in Harare, mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe, uh, at Buyane and the hospital <laughs> um, to, to my parents. Mm -hmm. I was, Are they alive? Are your parents no, alive? both my parents passed. Okay. I lost my mother when I was 17. Okay. Then I lost my dad uh, when I was around 30. Okay. Yeah. And which schools did you go to? <laughs> that question. The reason why I tend Laugh. to hesitate. You're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I hesitate because... Yeah. Well, they judge. They just immediately That's judge. All right. But let, it's okay. Let, let them judge. I'll let, let them you judge. judge. I'll yeah? let you judge. Mm -hmm. So for primary school, I started off at North Park in Mount Pleasant. I was there for grade one and two. Then in grade three, I went to boarding school in Diggerfold in Marondela. Then for high school, I was at Peter House. Mm -hmm. Yes. My daughter is at Peter House. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so I'm judging. Oh, you're judging me. <laughs> Um, yes. And then from Peter House? I went to university in South Africa. I mm. went to Monash University. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I came back. Then I did my master's in Zimbabwe. You did a master's in, in development studies. That's correct. Was that deliberate? What were you trying to achieve doing a master's in, in development studies? I feel like I just always felt like I need to do one more, just one more step. Initially, it was a, a business. I wanted to do a, a master's in business, but I thought, no, it's not really... So I, I sort of gravitated towards developmental studies because I felt like that was just more me. Mm. I think I'm more of a sort of psychologist, humanitarian, social studies type of you're person. You're a people person. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you're a people. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can feel that connection. Right. And when you look at the way you were brought up, your mom and dad, may their souls rest in peace, um, what, what did you get the most from your parents? Hard work. Mm. My parents were such hard workers. And I think, thinking about their lives, they grew up Kumusha, Kumondoro. They were neighbors, actually. So they left a rural setting to set up a life in Harare and were able to send three children to really good schools and to university. And they, they did whatever it took. My mom actually, mm. and they told me that, that they actually bought the house because she used to um, uh, how do you say that in English? To Kurugamajuzi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Google is going to use yes. make it English. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or a language. Precisely. Mm. And you know, and my father um, uh, was uh, was in corporate, and then he moved and started his own his own thing. He became an entrepreneur. So it's just I learned so much by just watching them and. They did their best. They did mm. exceedingly beyond what the odds were stacked against them, but they did really well, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. Mm. And um, you went into corporate. Tell me about your corporate journey. Um, so when I got back, uh, I worked. Got back from South Africa. From South Africa to University, Zimbabwe. Yes. Yeah. So I did a graduate training program for about a year. But I didn't enjoy that, unfortunately. Graduate training pr program with who? With, um, uh, what's it called? It was an, it's an agriculture okay. shop. You, okay. They you, sell agriculture. They, I just mm, can't remember the name. That's fine. That's all right. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't keen on selling seeds and and ripiki, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So uh, I did, as soon as I was done with that, I, I You decided I this is not for me. And you know what I love about that is I went and I told my dad. I sat him down and said, Dad, I'm not enjoying this. I really expected, uh, oh, this is life. You're not going to enjoy everything. Do you know what he says to me? Mm -hmm. He said, so quit. I said, really? I said, yes. I can do that. Quit. If you don't like it, leave. I thought, oh, thanks. 
So I left. And that's what I, that's another thing I picked up from my parents. Is one, they were very loving, actually. Mm -hmm. like, a lot of people say they didn't get hugs and kisses. That surprises me. You got lots of that. My parents were very affectionate. And they were also, um, like my dad, very honest. And if you don't like it, leave it. Because mm. we were, it's sometimes, you know, you feel like I have to do this. I have to do this. But with that, he said, if you don't like it, leave it. Mm -hmm. And so After from that, there, I go? moved to, um, it, was, it was someone who was doing private equity investment in mm -hmm. Zim from mm -hmm. South Africa. It's someone I knew. So I worked with them for a bit. Uh, I was their assistant. And then from there, I moved to, where did I move to from there? I moved to another small, so I was always into small companies, small startups, I, uh, microfinance, mm -hmm. and I worked there for a little bit. Then when it closed, then I moved to a big telecoms company. In Zimbabwe. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Then I worked there for about three years. And then you came into the diaspora. Then, yeah, yes. And so at that time, that's when I, it was so stressful for me. My mm. goodness, I was so stressed. In Zimbabwe. Yes. Talk, uh, to, talk to me about that stress. <laughs> what, what, I think what does it, it I was just like? in the wrong place. Yeah. I was just in the wrong place. Work-wise? Yes, work-wise. Okay. I felt this is, it's a good job and it, I, make, I can make money from this. So uh, one of the things I've now learned is no, that's, that shouldn't drive you. I was miserable. So miserable. The money was good. Yes. It was a good job. Yes, it but was. But you're miserable. I was miserable. The pressure was so much that I think at some point, I remember crying. Um, I was coming out of church, literally walking out of church, and my phone was ringing. Mm -hmm. And I had several missed calls from work. It's a Sunday. And I just felt violated. Like, I'm at, I'm at church. You can't even wait for me to come back to, to work on Monday. And that really upset me. And I thought, you know what? I think it's unfortunate I wasn't checking. Maybe it's fortunate. I wasn't checking my blood pressure at the time. But if I was, mm. I'm sure it was, it was really high. Um, so I left because it, was just, it wasn't working for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and is that the moment you decided to leave Zimbabwe and come to the diaspora? No, actually. No. I, I was still in Zim. And that's when I decided, because um, on the side, I had my a side hustle of uh, teaching Children. I've mm. always loved working with children. So I was teaching children to swim. Mm. So I was a swimming instructor on weekends. And then I thought, why don't I just do this full time? So I jumped ship, literally jumped, because there was no guarantee. Is this 2019? Yes. When you decided yes. enough of corporate life. I'm done with that. Um, I'm going to do this stuff. That's correct. Yeah. So well, what's, what I found interesting with that is you've done uh, finance. Yes. You've done investment. Yes. Um, you've done, tried selling seeds and nails. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, then you sickle on children. I mean, yes. that's fascinating. Right. Talk to me about that. I think it's the gift element that I, I possess. Um, I just think, in, in hindsight, I sat down and I, I did look at my life. And I thought, this is so clear. From the beginning, it was always, I was always with children. At church, I was always at the one doing the Sunday school. I, I was so comfortable with them. Then if it's at work, it's like, oh, you seem to be good at this. Why don't you do the training? So there's the teaching element. Uh, at university, I became a tutor. You know, help the, the first years. You seem to understand the concepts. You help the first years. So it, it just sort of was just clear throughout. Mm, mm. So I thought, well, and then my side hustle also with the children. I just needed to be with children at during my life somewhere so that was one of the the, the the parts I chose and that's how I ended up being a swimming instructor and then COVID hit mm. now I can't teach swimming but I need an income and that's where Shona was born mm. the, the Shona school when did you leave Zimbabwe I left Zimbabwe two years ago okay yes um, and then I came here mm. yes. what what were the what was the push or pull factor for you to come into the diaspora um because I know I can do much more if I have the resources. So I have, like, my mind is just so full of ideas, but I need to be in a particular place in order to be able to, to, to fulfill that. Um, just one of the things I'm even thinking is gaming, mm. Shona gaming. And how can I do that if I'm in Zimbabwe? I mean, I can, but... I think I, if I'm closer to people who develop these things, I, I think I, I'll be able to do it mm. better. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Are you beginning to 
enjoy the benefits of uh, being in the diaspora and where the resources are available? I would say yes. Mm. Um, I value convenience. I love convenience and that's why we do it online and so that a parent literally opens a laptop and does the lesson. Sometimes we even do it, the child is in the car on their way to another activity. So I just love the, the ability to do that and the use of technology. So this is why I want to put this in the tech space so that it's convenient and accessible. Mm. I like the, uh, the games, Shona games. Yeah. Um, what's your thinking around that? Well, we did them physically. But like I said, you're now in a country where you are the only Shona people in that region. Or maybe you do have other friends. But you'll find for me, I don't actually know some of the games that my parents used to play. So it's one of those, I will look for the ideas and we'll put it somewhere and then hopefully we can get it online. Because children love gaming. Mm. It's what they spend their days doing, especially when it's cold. They can't play outside. So at the very least, they can at least learn while they're, they're playing. Mm. Um, you, how many children of yours do you, do you have? I have one. You've got I one. I have a son, yes. And uh, are you finding, how old is the son? He's 13. He's 13, yes. Um, these challenges that you're talking about, um, the languages, the issue of identity, I mean, I like one thing that you said here, that what you're doing is not just a language program. Right. It's a movement to demystify the challenges of learning Shona. Is, is that contained in your life, Are you see, in his life rather, are you seeing that happening? Yes. I'll give Talk you, to me about that. Oh, I, it's, it's so rewarding because I decided to be very deliberate. So what we did is we started to w work on our family tree. But because I don't know his father's side, we went uh, kwa Sekuru. Sekuru, we want to learn about our family. Oh, he was beyond excited. That's what they like to do, grandparents. Mm. Mm. Um, so we went to Sekuru and then he, he, he drew it out for us and we documented it. And then we did my side of the family. I went to my tete and she also documented it. What I please implore people to do is record it because you'll find my tete kept forgetting. <laughs> because now it's all, it was all oral, yeah. you know, it wasn't recorded. So now because he found out that his origins are Portuguese, ha! Mm. Huh, now he just wants to go to Portugal. That's all he talks about. I want to go to Portugal. And so it's one of those where he's now become excited mm. about who he is mm. uh, in terms of his background and his, his identity because now he knows it what forms who he is today. And now if he's informed by his history and knowing what he is, you know, his gifts, his traits, and the people who came before him, he then has an idea of who he is and what then he can occupy the space of... Um, his, his, his purpose on this earth. Why is it important for us to be aware of our identity? I mean, some people mm. would say, you know, oh, we, we, we live in a global village um, and, um, you know, I'm okay wherever I am. Why does it matter for uh, the Shona identity, the Zimbabwean identity? Why should we go there? Because you can't fully fulfill your purpose if you don't know who you are. Knowing who you are informs your purpose sort of so I know that I can sing I can teach so this is why I'm in this space that okay and I will always see here's the thing everyone was created on purpose there's no mistakes we're too detailed to be mistakes so because my son is who he is so for example my son now knows who he is he was made on purpose and he's detailed so it also means God made him a Shona boy on purpose. Mm. God made him come from me and his dad on purpose. And he comes from his grandparents. On Everything is deliberate because it needed to be, he needed to be who he is to have the particular DNA that he has in order to fulfill his purpose. And he must know that so purpose. So he has to know. Because if he doesn't, how then do you do what you're supposed to do? Mm. It's like going into, uh, into a space of, of, of you know, uh, I don't know, mm. maths, mm. but you have no idea how to add. Mm. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Electo, I'm going to stop you there. Um, please at home, don't go away. When we come back, I want to just, just go to perhaps an uncomfortable space. You are in the diaspora. What are the pain points? What are the pleasures? I know a lot of people say it's not a bed of roses out mm -hmm. here. Um, so when you come back, we're going to go to that, to that, uh, to that place. So please 
see you on the other side. I feel like I don't have as much time at home with my son as I would like. Um, even to socialize, there's very little. It's like socially bankrupt. I, I, I barely mm. have time. Mm. Welcome to our conversation with uh, Elekta Kudzai Vambe, a creative singer, songwriter, cultural ambassador, and, and a teacher. I love books, um, and books are very important in this show. You have already written a book. Talk to us through, you know, the, the idea of writing this book. Okay. And how long it took you to, to, to write, write this it. book. Mamiriro Ekunze. You can maybe try this one. Ah, umumom kati. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Talk to me about the experience and, and the motivation. Very good. So um, at one time, someone prophesied to me that I was carrying a book. And for me, it was a really detailed 400-page book because I had a book I wanted to write. But I just thought, oh, it's a negative space. So... Why don't I write this book? And it's my pride and joy. There's so many more coming. This is not just the only one. Um, so what I wanted to do in this book is inclusion. If you notice on the cover, you've got different races. Well, it's mm. the same race children, but they're different. They look mm. different. Mm. So we have a mixed child, a black child, a child with uh, albinism, and a child with vitiligo. Mm -hmm. Because we want children to understand that as much as we are the same, we're also different. Mm. And there's nothing okay. wrong with that. Yeah. This, it's okay. Um, so, so I wrote it in, in the simplest form because I, I noticed that my students, a lot of them can't speak Shona, so mm. there's no need for it to be detailed and laborious in reading. So I, it's very simple, but it's fun, very colorful. Like I said, I like, to, I like a lot of color. So that was... Um, the, the, the inspiration from the lessons. So each lesson is, I wanted to have a book to go mm, with it. Mm. And this is one of the, the, the books, one of the lessons, the weather mm. with the song. So it's got a song, a book and the lesson. Mm. Yes. Talk to me about the, what's been the biggest challenge that you've experienced in the work that you do and what could be a big game changer for your, for your, for your current pursuit? The biggest challenge, I'll start with initially, was being laughed at. Hmm. Oh, I was laughed at. To some to an extent where someone called me and said, do you need a job? Do you need, you seem to... That hurt me. <laughs> oh, man. Yes. They called and said, you seem desperate. Do you need a job? I can help you. And I said, no, I'm perfectly fine. Thank you. I really am. So I love this with my entire heart. And as much as I ignored the laughs, I mean, I... Do you still talk to this person who said you need not, a job? I have not right now, <laughs> but I just understood them. Yeah. I, I wasn't judged. I didn't... I, I, under, I understood them. They just didn't get it. And a, a lot of people laughed at me because... I, I understand that too. I'm not exactly the best Shona speaker. I just told you I dropped out at ZJC. Yeah. So I... And I'm, I predominantly speak English. But I said to myself, let me teach what I can. Then where I end, mm. we get somebody else to come in. And that's what we do. We, we've got other teachers who continue after a certain, at the beginning, and then they continue because they were, they're qualified to do it. Mm. So, um, so that's, you were laughed at. What else? Um, what other challenge? One of the other challenges was not knowing <laughs> what to do. So I'll tell you the story of so how I So you did even, it whilst not knowing what to do. I won't even lie to you. The initial, I had lessons starting. For the first ever lesson was on the 2nd of June in 2020. I think on the, on maybe on the 28th of May, I still didn't know. I didn't even have my first lesson. So I reached out to a good friend of mine. I have to mention her, Wadzanai yeah. Chiwiri. And she... Wadzanai? Chiwiri. Mm -hmm. She did A-level Shona. And she helped me. She sat with me and she put together the first maybe two or three lessons. Said we start with A-E-U-U-U. And we go from there. She gave me material to help me along. And from there, we just took off. And here we are. 
Any, Here we any are. other battles that you've had to endure? The students just kept coming. And because of the nature of the lessons, I didn't even need to advertise at that point. They were just telling each other. And they, oh, I heard from so-and-so that you do this. Yeah. I heard from so-and-so. And to the point where I remember I had 60 students and I was teaching them alone in 2020. That was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, because of the time zones, I'd start as early as 8 o'clock in Australia and then finish at midnight with the American students. So uh, it was, but it was so rewarding. I really, really enjoyed it. And you started not knowing what to do. Yes. A lot of people would say, that's a recipe for disaster. But I know somebody who says, actually, that's a good thing. Talk to me about, it, it, it can't be easy, mm -hmm. starting something not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. There's a lesson there for a lot of people. I mean, how did you do it? Talk to us about the, the, the doubting yourself, the fear of I don't know enough. I think that that whole, if you don't know how to do something, say, say yes and then figure it out, learn how to do it. So like I said, I reached out to a friend who had done a level Shona, so it, I think she knew what she was talking about. And the whole, just reach out to your network, you will find somebody who knows or at least can guide you. And with time, I started getting people just reaching out to actually help. I had a parent who said to me, you need to register this, this is big. I had uh, uh, another parent who reached out and said, why don't you try this and I'd get ideas. And so another challenge is the finances to then do these big ideas that I, I have mm. <laughs> that, uh, that, I, well, that also came from other people, um, like the gaming and the animations. I want to have animations. We want children to watch cartoons in Shona. Is that work in progress or some, is still an idea? It's something I want to do. I okay. have been talking to some friends. Mm. I've got other friends in the mm. space. We have a good animation people watching right now, ah. both in Zim and in the UK. We actually have some that we'll be talking to. Yes, So please do mm. reach out. Let's collaborate. Let's do something. Mm. I do have some friends in the same space. We've yeah. got Noto kids in South Africa who are also there into animation for, for children. We've got here, yeah, Tida and Tipa. Mm -hmm. They also do animation. We've got, oh, there's just so many of them. We've got Gomayorira, they write books for mm. children. So there's a lot of us who are pushing this cultural identity agenda. So, yeah, that's, it's, it's powerful for me mm. that it's not a one man thing it's we're all trying so I, I did say and a lot of people have said to me that uh, and i was in the diaspora myself for 18 years in south africa um being in the diaspora is not a, a bed of roses no talk to to us now about your own personal experiences the good and bad mm -hmm. of being in the diaspora i'll start with the the good i value convenience i love convenience things shouldn't be hard yeah so I like that. I really appreciate the convenience of having things delivered to you. <laughs> because, but I think the negative of it is they have to be delivered to you because you're never home. Mm. You're always working. It's work, work, work. So I feel like I don't have as much time at home with my son as I would like. Um, even to socialize, there's very little. It's like socially bankrupt. I, I, I barely mm. have time mm. to, to, to share with, you know, times with people. You have to really sacrifice because a lot of the time, your relative doesn't even live close enough to, for mm. you to pass through. Mm. You have to plan and drive an hour and a half to go and see them and drive an hour and a half back. Um, so that's the, the, the unfortunate part. What um, makes being in the diaspora worth it? This. Okay. I, I know what I want to do. And I know that this is the, this is the path to do mm. it. And I know it's God ordained. What, what's the big picture when you look um, five years down, down the road? What is it that you're trying to build? I see children loving who they are, self-love, and just preservation. This is not Nakayedu. This is mm. I call it Nakayedu because it's our. It's the. It's, it's, I'm the custodian of this. We all are, and I need to pass it on in as as the best form that I can. And so I see children being proud of who they are, sharing who they are. I had a particular student in Australia who actually said, I said, I always ask, why do you want to do these lessons? And he says to me, because I have nothing to say on cultural day at school. Wow. I don't know That's anything painful, about myself, yeah. where I come from. You know, the Japanese children come with kimonos. These ones come with that. And I have nothing. And I thought, mm. oh, that's devastating. I said, don't worry, I've got you. So, I, you know, we taught him. And then guess what? Like three months later, he says, ma'am, can you please stop calling me by my English name? And can you start calling me Panache? Wow. 
from there, I started calling myself Kudzai. I actually call myself that because he inspired me. And I thought, he's so proud of who he is. And now he has something to share with his... Um, with because his you friends. have done it. Because Kudzai has encouraged yes, that. Yes, that's exactly it. And like I said, in the lessons, we don't just teach language. Mm. We Beyond that, we teach food, mm. manners, mm. even to, to, to greet. Every lesson, Magadi Mudzidzis. When we're leaving, Chisarai Mudzidzis. You know, um, we boys learn, we teach them. That even before you eat, I'm sorry. When they're done, ah, Taguta Mudzidzis, Tinotend. Even though they're eating food at their own house. But we try and make it as practical as possible um, so that they, it's not just language, it's beyond that. Tsika. Mm, mm. Eh, and they know. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's <laughs> beautiful. Like that. you, I think you've already hinted there. What gives you the biggest kick from what you're doing? The reward is the joy of the child and, and the pride that they have. It, they'll come and tell me, did you see today at school? I told someone, because sometimes it's not even just about Shona, just confidence. They said this horrible thing to me and I told them, well, I like the way that, that I am. My hair is fine because a lot of it's got to do with hair as well. So we do affirmations as well. We have a song that we sing. We go, Ganda rangu rakanaka, Vudzi rangu rakanaka, Inini ndakanaka, ndakanaka, ndakanaka. And we sing that. So it's, it's... That's beautiful. Yes, it's just always to encourage you are perfect the way you are. No need to alter who and, you And are. this is important in the diaspora because yes. I suppose you step out of the door even before you do you do that out of the house you've already encountered uh, some 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 systemic uh, yes. racism on television and then in real life yes. so that kind of affirmation is is very important isn't it exactly yeah. and i think children experience it more than we do because grown-ups have a little bit of restraint, um, but not children. And you are equipping them to face exactly. the world. Exactly. What, what about taking it a step higher? Mm. Um, this is not your responsibility, but as you're talking, I was listening to a professor the other day who says, Africa, the African Union has said Swahili mm -hmm. should be our language. Mm -hmm. So that we as Africans have a language with which we can communicate the 54 nations right. uh, on, on the continent. What's your take on that? I get that. Um, just like there's pigeon for most of West Africa, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with learning another language. Mm. I think that's, that's okay. Um, I'm actually wanting to translate. We've actually translated this into Swahili. Mm. We just need to finish it up and, and put it on the platform on Amazon. But I don't see anything wrong so with that. So there's an opportunity there for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, yes. I'm very aware that Swahili is a uh, big... Yeah. But I get it because it's spoken in a lot more, lang in a mm. lot more countries. Mm. Um, but I, I am for that. Learn another language. Why not? Mm. But just don't forget yourself. Mm. We tend to rush to learn French and German. But, but what about your own language? Could I... Is there anything that would make you to consider going back to Zimbabwe? Is there anything that, that, you, that would uh, make you pack your, your suitcases and say, I'm going back home? What would that be? If I had the assistance, financial assistance to do this, yes. I would to do, do this back home? Yes, I would definitely. Because mm. I, I, my heart is there. That's where it is. Uh, but I'm just here because I have to do something in order to finance this. Mm. But if it's there... I'll just do this full time. What's, what's, what message would you have for young women who are watching you? Mm -hmm. Our audience is global. Mm -hmm. They're watching you from all over the world. They're admiring what you've done, doing something when you know nothing about it, right. and uh, doing something where people are laughing at you and say you should be doing something, doing something else. What message would you have for them? Is just love yourself enough to learn about yourself. We tend to judge. See, someone else told us that our culture is evil. Someone else. And, their pers and, the, and the group of people are not even in our culture. But they told us this and we believed them. Mm. At the very least, just do your research. Research with an open mind mm. and then decide. So that's what I would say because I've learned so much by just researching, asking questions with an open mind and understanding why 
they, why our ancestors did what they did and why they lived like this, uh, there's, a, there's a reason for everything. Mm. And you will find that that reason is going to build your character. Mm. They wanted us to be a, specific, a particular character which will thrive and do well in this world. We're beautiful. Very. We're special. Taganaka, taganaka. We're going to go to books now because a lot of people that watch this show love the Trevor Club book mm -hmm. recommendations. By the way, we've started a book club uh, on WhatsApp, which is actually going crazy. Um, I think we've got uh, over 600 people that are on that group and the conversations are absolutely amazing. So what three books would you share with our book loving audience out there? Okay, so the first book is a parenting book. It's got a really long title. It's called The Book You Wish Your Parents Had Read and your children will be glad that you did. <laughs> <laughs> the author is um, Philippa Perry. Mm -hmm. It's a, I just love how she goes into parenting. I need to read that. Yes, it's, I think it's, it's, it's profound in that it, it helps you to understand your children mm -hmm. better. The author is? Uh, Philippa Perry. Mm, Philippa Perry, yes. okay. okay. Second uh, book? The second book is by Tori Dunlap. Uh, it's called Financial Feminist. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the world in general finances and the financial space is occupied by by men and i love how this young lady she's only what in her 20s mm -hmm. and she's a millionaire and she shares the practical ways of finan being um, financially free and i think that every every not even just women everyone, everyone should, should read, read that it. because it demystifies the fear of those jargon those mm. big words that and she just makes it as simple as possible in how to manage your finances. Mm -hmm. The third one? Oh. <laughs> the third yes, book. Yes, Kunze yes. by Oh, she's an amazing author. <laughs> <laughs> she's from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Uh, and um, this, this is just the first of many books. Mm. There are way more coming. Mm. And I, I just always think of um, what uh, Miles Monroe said. He said, when you, the, the graveyard is, is full and I, I need to empty all these books I need to empty out so that when I go to my grave mm. I'm empty and I've done everything I was purposed to do. Oh beautiful this has been amazing talking Thank you to you. Thank so much. There's a book in all of us. That's it. If not books in all of us. That's true. Uh, and if we, we take time to, to get into ourselves and, and unearth those books like you're doing. Uh, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you so much. Um, we, we're proud of what you're doing. We wish you all the very best. Hopefully when we come back uh, for the in conversation with Trevor, UK series next time, we'll be able to sit down with you and and, and maybe you would have written another book. That's correct. Yeah. More. Not more just books. one. A yeah. lot of more books. Yeah. Thank you so much for creating the time Thank you to, so to much, join Mr. us. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you. Allow me now to turn to our viewers who are all over the world who watch us uh, every Monday. Remember, we are a weekly show. We are out on Mondays, 7 a.m. Central African time on YouTube. To ensure that you don't miss out on any of these quality conversations, I invite you to go onto YouTube, uh, press that uh, subscribe button, like, and share. We've gone a step further and, and, and built a, a website where all our content sits, our newsletter, which is weekly. Go onto that uh, website. Again, click onto the subscribe button for the newsletter, and you get our uh, refreshing, thought-provoking insights every week. Until next time. Cheers to you all.